Hey guys, it's Bob Morianelli with the Tuning School, and on today's Tech Tuesday, I'll be talking with Mike Sitar from Magnuson Superchargers. We're doing a Tech Tuesday video on positive displacement blowers, so you're definitely going to want to watch this one. All right. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm here with Mike Sitar from Magnuson Superchargers, and Mike is actually the president, and he's formerly from Eaton. So we're going to pick his brain today, and we're going to go pretty deep into the world of positive displacement superchargers. So uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. Welcome. Hi, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're happy to see you and chat for a little bit, man. Um, we've been doing this Tech Tuesday series for forced induction. Um, we've had so many inquiries from guys in the past that said, hey, I want to learn more about force induction, uh, what's right for me, and I want to really kind of learn deeper, you know, about these types of things. So in the last couple of videos, we've talked a lot about turbos, positive displacement, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, centrifugal, and today positive displacement. So um, let me just start by asking you, you know, what's the, the major benefits of going with a positive displacement over a centrifugal blower or say a turbo, something like that? Sure. Okay. Well, majority of it is based around performance. It's the low speed operation all the way through the high speed. Sure. Um, and I think a lot of it's the technology's advanced over the years. Um, you know, the previous early Eaton rotors and the Eaton, even before that, the 671s and the 871 type blowers mm -hmm. had a really good low speed response. But as the, um, as the RPM went up, they tended to really beat the air, mm -hmm. not provide really good performance up there. So um, over the years, there's been continual development in these devices, which allows them to provide as well as an extended high speed performance. Um, so your benefit with a positive displacement unit is the instantaneous torque. Um, there's it basically boosts as fast as you can open the throttle, um, and then uh, providing that power quite efficiently right through the entire operating range. So what you're saying is they've they've really improved a lot since their early days and no longer is it just like a low to mid-range type device you can you can carry that power now correct that's right cool um, so it, it like i said it allows that uh, much higher efficiencies and a lot of them are based around the design of the rotors and things like that that are put in these devices today cool so, cool so i'd imagine you know with the development of computer software and and all the stuff you guys have you can develop blades and rotors and things that are just if taking efficiency to some higher level than you used to have so you don't quite get such high IETs and stuff as you used to. Is that where right. most of the benefits are coming? Most definitely. And I mean in, in any every case even with these units here um, the design of the specific unit is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the OEM type scenarios uh, like when providing units for GM whether it be a, a Z06 or a ZR1 or uh, any of the boosted items that are, happen there. Mm -hmm. uh, GM have a very big focus around the low speed performance sure. as well as the noise control. Oh, so yeah. there are yeah. two things which are uh, not terribly important in the aftermarket world. Right, yeah. So, you know, at Magnuson then we tend to um, focus more on the performance side. Sure. So we'll take a little bit of trade off in noise, mm -hmm. a little trade off in a low speed performance even possibly mm -hmm. to deliver a much higher high speed performance. Sure. Uh, and that allows us to tailor that compressor map Right. for the supercharger to the application that we want to have it on. Okay, so. yeah, well that makes perfect sense. So um, I think this is a, the next question I have, um, and we've compounded these questions from you know Tech Tuesday guys watching all over the world, and, okay. and the, the most popular question by far has been, explain to me the different types of positive displacement blowers. So everybody just says, oh, it's a roots blower. And it, what does that, you know, I know there's, there's several different types. And what, can you elaborate on that a little bit on what types there are and, and kind of the, the physical differences under, sure. the, under that? Well, typically a roots blower will have two, of, two symmetrical rotors. Um, they'll be opposites of each other, but they will be the same basic rotor. Um, and within a roots device, there's generally no ability to do any sort of compression. Okay. Um, even though the rotors can get more twist, uh, they still have what we refer to as blow holes through the top of the rotor set um, if you twist them too far. And if you go a little bit too far, then they actually leak the whole time. Okay. Um, a screw, on the other hand, is the other type of positive displacement device. Um, that does have uh, intermeshing rotors. So you have a male and a female rotor in those, which uh -huh. allow you to close that blow hole that would exist if you want to twist it more. So you're getting um, actual compression in a twin screw then? Theoretically, yes. Okay. Theoretically, you're trying to get it internal compression. Okay. Uh, the problem you have is that, I mean, in many screws, the 
the control volume is quite small. As you might guess, there's, uh, you know, some have 5.3 mm -hmm. uh, per lobe, some have 4.6 per lobe. And if you take that displacement divided by those amount of uh, control volumes, mm -hmm. and then we look at the leakage, you know, say eight or ten thousandths of clearance in mm -hmm. some of those units, then the internal compression you'd like to actually see, mm -hmm. um, quite often it's lost. Okay. And that's kind of what we found in a lot of cases, hence the reason we developed the TVS series. Now, when um, you say 5.3 and 4.6, what, what measurement are you referring to? I'm referring to the number of lobes on the rotors. Okay. Uh, so screws always have a, a, a male and a female. Okay. One will have normally four, and the other one will be six. Oh, five and three. Five and three, lobes. I understand. Lobes per. I get it. That, right. That makes so perfect the other, sense. The one other thing that also limits, uh, limits us a little bit too in that, that type of positive displacement design is the maximum speed. Yes. So you're always spinning. You're belt driving normally the slower rotor, which would be the one with the five lobes on it. Right. And the three lobe has to spin that. This thing, oh, that, yeah. that, you know, that many times faster, five thirds times faster to keep up. Wow. So you quickly run into bearing limitations uh, in some cases. Where on a roots blower, the two lobes spin exactly the same speed. Okay. So your bearing limitation is not based off just one rotor, it's based off of both. Okay. And that allows them to run a much higher speed. Uh, so effectively, okay. a smaller roots device will pump more air than an equivalent um, a larger device. Which would be your speed. twin screw. Okay. That makes right. sense. And so you, you talked a second ago about the TBS series. Can I elaborate on that as to why that would be, you know, the next, you know, the future there? Right. Well, the TBS is the, um, it's the latest generation uh, from Eaton. Okay. Uh, Magnuson uses an Eaton rotating group. Mm -hmm. So we purchased that, that rotating group from Eaton. Then we produce our own housings, porting, okay. clearances, uh, bearings, everything else we want to run is, is done as per our specification. Okay. So, um, and that's just currently the latest version. Okay. Uh, there is some other TVSs out there. There's a TVS2 that's been released. Um, that is more of a focus towards a low speed, um, faster response device. So more um, like a GM OEM. For use in a, in a, a compound boosting system. Oh, so, compound boost. Uh, so like so a fire that's truck. Kind of, that's kind of where that, where that's heading to. Um, but mm -hmm. as we move on, there will of course be TVS three and four and, mm -hmm. and, and items along those ways. Yeah, that makes so, sense. That makes sense. So are all the TBSs um, twin screw or, or are they? They're all roots. They're all roots? They're all, um, yeah, they're all roots and they're all a four lobe design. Okay. And so, so. if you were building um, a combo for the average street car, which would you recommend? The roots type, the twin screw, or what, what would you look at? Um, well, I mean, generally the, it's, the roots is pretty much, the, the TBS specifically roots is pretty much the most efficient mm -hmm. positive displacement blower out there. Okay. Um, I, I don't know any of them that are more efficient than that unit. Um, the only thing we run into with the TBS is a limit on size. Okay. So, um, you know, the largest unit that Eaton currently makes is a 2300. Yep. So a 2.3 liter. Mm -hmm. So that limits us to that kind of power output from there. Gotcha. Um, and that's kind of where you'll see other people, you know, move to some different brands in some cases and different designs mm -hmm. merely because they want more size. More displacement. It's just not big enough. Right. So, um, so that's, that's pretty much the only limitation. No, um, the TBS is, uh, I mean, it's on all the OEM vehicles. Eaton's right. the only OEM supplier that exists out there. And, and, and there's a reason because, you know, Eaton sure. can test everything and so can the OEMs. Right. So when they test everything. There's trust. They, they have the data. I mean, what you don't know, you don't know. But if you do know, then you make your decision off that. So. That's a very good point. So, so given that there are some variants in sizes, um, what, how would you correctly size a roots type blower or something, you know, a positive displacement blower? Let's say you're the average enthusiast at home or shop owner. I mean, we have a lot of shop owners that, you know, they get these questions every day. A guy comes in with his Camaro, his Mustang. He's like, man, I, I need a blower. What do I get? Okay, well, we need to get you something that's of the roots type variety. How would they know which, you know, which, which size really to, to recommend? Okay, well, like, like I said, a lot of it will depend on the uh, performance you're looking for from the vehicle and how you want the vehicle to drive. Okay. Um, if we're looking at a, a, a car, let's say a Camaro or something like that, we, we would probably get the largest unit we have on that, a 2300, okay. uh, which is going to give you a little softer, low speed performance. Mm -hmm. um, you'll still have a great boost response and still quite a bit of boost down low, but then it, it shifts your perform island, your performance island in the map mm -hmm. to a higher operating point. Um, and that's, of course, going to align with where your peak torque is going to be or your peak power. Okay. The further you push that high efficiency island up to the operating range, that will give you the highest performance from that standpoint. So but, similar to a turbo. 
if we're running a pickup truck right um of the exact same size engine let's say we have a six two six two liter pickup mm-hmm. i would probably go with a slightly smaller unit a mm-hmm. 1900 or even a 1740 okay uh, for pickup trucks mainly because you have a lot more mass there to get moving uh-huh. um and you'll take that advantage of the torque at mm-hmm. lower speed mm-hmm. to get that big vehicle moving yeah that makes sense so similar to cam design really when you think about it you're not right. going to put right. a giant cam in a pickup truck and go fast it's, exactly yeah i mean at the end of the day when you're going it's power under the curve yep it makes the car go fast right i mean you'll forever see right you know big power numbers big power numbers i mean i remember mm-hmm. all the import stuff you know with the, i do the power numbers yep. and the straight numbers and I, uh, there were some good jokes around about some supers at one time i think if they're I always the I, I know the joke i have it memorized it was so, something about what's the difference between a, a 400 horsepower supra and a 1200 horsepower supra and it was like nothing they both run 13s one just exactly, yeah, it was something like that. yeah okay. this one's so doing 140 at the so, end uh so like, like i said the power under the curve is what we're looking for right. and depending on which vehicle it is will move that where that power under that curve occurs at okay so if you're the if you're the average shop owner you know you're going to look at it and say man you got a you know a big truck here we need to move you on the lower side of the yep. blower now would they say um, are they looking at mass in terms of like weight of vehicle or are they looking at size in terms of blower you know is that like what's the deciding factor for them what's better it, it's generally going to be I, I mean i'll be honest with you majority of the time the customer is always going to want to pick the largest blower they can pick they're guys uh, it's, it's guys it's better in everyone's mm-hmm. mind um and and that's just of course until they lose to someone else of course. and uh, then they've got to wonder why yeah but, um, so normally it's just it's just around the fact of how heavy the vehicle is and what you're going to move. Okay. I mean, once you start looking at the maps, you can see where the flow is. They're pretty pretty linear flow the whole way across. Mm-hmm. It's just that efficiency island moving around. Okay. Um, and how your how your power curve moves through that efficiency island. Okay, is that that makes sense. So really, it's similar to turbo sizing in that regard. It, most definitely. Okay. Yeah, I would say that With, without the limits. I mean, we don't have a low speed surge line, mm-hmm. so you're not going to run into a surge line, and you still have a maximum speed. But it's normally about twice the width of a an equivalent compressor map from a turbo. Wow. So we okay. Move it a lot further than you can with a turbocharger. Uh, okay. I mean, a perfect example is you know a, a ZR1 mm-hmm. had a 2300 on it, mm-hmm. and uh, that was more focused. If you drove one, it was a little softer off the bottom, and it felt like it would still pull right to the moon. Yeah. Uh, with the ZL6 now, the new ZL6, the C7, mm-hmm. you drive one of them, it's it's an absolute animal at three grand or it four is. grand. Yeah, it is. It just kind of holds a really flat. Uh, horsepower curve up at the top, right? Um, and that's the you know the aspect of that smaller blower, right? On that larger engine, right? So. That makes perfect sense. So in in the case of a positive displacement blower, is there uh, a difference in reading like the supercharger's compressor map versus doing it on something like a turbo? Are they very similar? Um, yeah, no, they're they're fairly different uh, because they're. You know, one's a volumetric device. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the Baruch device is volumetric, right. so that map is done in in volume. Okay. Um, and of course, you can convert it to kilograms or pounds per you okay. know per, yeah. pounds per hour, pounds right. per minute, however you want to look at it. So it can be done that way, um, but it, it's different the way the unit passes through it. Okay. So uh, I would say the actual plotting parts is pretty similar. Okay. But, uh, but the islands will be different, and the exactly. the layouts yeah. will be a bit different. Like, are these are these maps usually available for guys when they're trying to buy? Are they on websites or? I think I think Eaton has a, a good portion of the out there online. Okay. Uh, I think you, uh, Eaton was pretty good at trying to get the latest compressor maps out there. Okay. Um, but you have to remember those compressor maps are from an OEM vehicle. Okay. Um, Eaton doesn't do any aftermarket parts themselves, okay. so uh, it's pretty uncommon you're going to find anything other than a a small port, uh, you know, quiet blower out there that's right. not be focused at the high high end RPM. Okay. So, Okay, well that makes sense then. So, uh, guy going for the most power is really just going to lean towards something larger, like a twenty three hundred. Right. And most that's definitely. okay. Yeah, as long as the motor's big enough. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's say you have a smaller motor, like a five liter Mustang. Yeah. Like a twenty eleven five liter, you know, Mustang. Like, uh, you might not want to go up on that bigger size, maybe like a nineteen hundred. Yeah, even depending though... on what it's, if it's going to be daily driver, I'd probably do a nineteen hundred on that. Right. That would be the best choice. Right. And then, uh, you know, if, if it's a drag car, I would probably shoot more for the. Uh, the sure. 2300 at that point so really it could also come down to combo maybe it's a stalled automatic with yep. like a 4000 rpm stall might be better off with a larger uh, oh definitely yeah, yeah in those cases you can get away with a lot of stuff yeah but if when the stall is low i mean for example even like the new camaros and mm-hmm. the, the new uh corvettes mm-hmm. with the a8s and them yeah they have a fairly low first gear mm-hmm. but they also have a pretty low stall converter right so it's uh 
you know, it's kind of one of those things where you need that torque to get sure. that car moving. Sure. Camaro's not a light car, but no. I understand it's lighter than lighter than the previous generation. Lighter than but heavy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still not what I refer to as a light car. Right, so, makes uh, sense. Yeah, it needs all the torque you can get out of that, and um, and same with the Corvette. Um, yeah. I do often hear, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, I'm going to go with some Trepco because it's softer on the tires, it's this and that." Mm-hmm. Um, in reality, I, I can't find any reason you'd ever want to do that for okay. me. I mean, I you can either number one drive the car, mm-hmm. or number two, um, yeah. I, I don't, you, you guys are the tuning shop. I mean, yeah. I can go in any one of these, and I can set my RPM versus throttle position sure. uh, to handle it. Sure. And the thing about it is, is that you get if you build something that way that you're limiting yourself at low speed torque mm-hmm. and not having so much torque because you're worried about a tire or something like that. Right. Well, some tracks I've gone to, yeah, I can definitely you know, make the drag radial spin mm-hmm. leaving the line. Mm-hmm. But then other days there's tracks that are prepped well. Right. And, and you're hooking. Days, you need all, all the torque you can possibly put down. Got everything. It goes fast. And that'll be the difference between you running 10s or 9s and mm-hmm. somebody else running 11s right. or 10s. You know? Right, right. So, um, well, which is huge. That makes perfect sense. And actually leads me to my next question, which is, um, can you go too big on the supercharger and, and I know we were talking about optimizing a minute ago, but yep. is there a line where now you've really crossed the line and, yeah, you know what, that blower is just too big. I mean, we hear turbos all the time. You know what, man, that turbo is just too big. And, you yep. know, for what you're doing, it's it's going to spool at 6,000 RPM. Do you have any worries on, you know what I mean, on the extreme yep. side of things? Yeah. Um, well, with our products currently, I don't think that's a big issue because unless you're going to run a 2.3 or 2.0 liter engine. Right. Uh, you know, in those cases, then beaten would be too big in those cases. Okay. But the majority of people who are going to boost their vehicle, they're going to buy the biggest vehicle they can. Not the biggest vehicle. They're going to buy the highest end vehicle they can normally. Sure. Get the biggest engine option they have. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to go for some boost right. uh, from there. Right. So um, with our current line, I would say it's, it's really not possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you could put pretty much any of our, our blowers in most cases. Right. Um, you know, we, of course, are always looking at it. And I, you know, we'll neither confirm nor deny the presence of a... A uh, potentially larger unit. Um, sure. We'll just have to wait a little, little later this year to see where that ends up. That's but, okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe someday in the future we will see the point where I could say, yeah, that's too big of a right. and blower for you there. That's so, cool. That's a good target, right? Yeah, bet. Yep. That's a good target. So, um, in terms of the types of customers, so you know, like your your shop owners got your street driven daily drivers your occasional track guys, and then your hardcore. You know, they're kind of, everybody kind of is in one of those categories who's, you know, they're, they're light to crazy, if you know what I mean, in terms of their goals. Is there a, a typical type of positive displacement blower that generally will fit one group better than the other? Um, I, I, I don't feel so. I mean, they all perform pretty much similarly. Okay. You know, these changes we're talking about are not huge. It's not like a turbo when you're off on size, you're going to be, you know, okay, we used to come out full boost at 2,500. Now we don't get any boost till four grand. Right, okay. You, know, you, you can't make that kind of change with a positive displacement blower. Okay. No matter how big it is, it's going to make boost. a significant amount of boost right. everywhere. So whether um, it's a roots or a twin screw, it, it doesn't really have exactly. a huge, it doesn't you're swing. Going make, you're going to make some pros. The biggest thing just comes down to size. Okay. Look at the highest, the hardcore portion. Right. I mean, the only really big blowers when we start looking at, you know, the... Uh, uh, the, the funny car, heads right. up, funny car glasses, stuff like that. Right. But then you need a really large blower. Right. And uh, it, it, it's just a matter of choice. And that would be a large cased roots type blower right. in that. Now, if you put that large of a blower on a smaller engine, you're going to suffer a lot of efficiency. Right. Um, because when these when these roots blowers are at low speed, mm-hmm. I mean, anything at low speed is going to leak. Mm-hmm. So the bigger unit you get, more you pretty much count on the less less efficiency you're going to have at low speed. Right. So you're essentially going to take more power to drive the blower for less output. Makes sense. Absolutely. So, so efficiency and pumping exactly. loss and things of that nature just, exactly. they add so, up. So there's definitely a point where you go too big mm-hmm. and you're going to get beat by the smaller, the guy with a smaller blower right. because he was sized properly. That makes but, sense because your, your pumping losses are there whether you're at part throttle or full throttle, right? I mean, there's, well, yes. yeah. yeah, I mean, you still have some some parasitic losses there from well, the it. the biggest thing you have is that um, uh, with the, with the, with the roots blower, the parasitic portion of it, um, and when I define parasitic, mm-hmm. you know, there's pumping work, right? and then there's parasitic. Okay. So parasitic is truly energy, which is not being used for anything. Okay. Okay, so that's bearings. Mm-hmm. That's seals. Okay. That's belts. You that's know, a good like description. That. That's, that's it's good. It's things that you get no benefit for whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, the work of the blower, turning the blower itself, is, you know, 
that's pumping work. Right. You're, you're using that work. You want right. that. Right. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll always hear the turbo guy say, well, we're using the, the end exhaust energy. And, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, it's an enthalpy device. So mm-hmm. there's a portion of that exhaust energy that's being used, mm-hmm. and the rest of it is back pressure. Right. So it's it's not even quite a 50-50 mix. Um, if I sit down and do the math, it's you can pretty quickly see, okay, well, we have a potato in the pipe, mm-hmm. and we're going to boost the top. And all, unless you're going to run a unit without any wastegate at all and optimize it for it, right. that's the only time you're going to run a near near net zero or a slightly positive differential across the engine. Mm-hmm. Um, with a Roots or any supercharger, you always have a positive differential. So while we're seeing that belt work being used from the crankshaft to turn the blower, mm-hmm. when that engine has 10 pounds of boost on the intake side mm-hmm. and zero on the exhaust, right. i got to be honest with you, you stand back, I, I can sit here on the dyno and watch the engine just start rolling over mm-hmm. with no fuel in it mm-hmm. because you do gain some of that belt uh, belt power back through the pumping ah, in the engine because it's a positive differential across the engine. So, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, turbo is free, superchargers using 100 horse. Right. I mean, uh, well, that's a total crock. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you get into any scenario where you're actually going to sit down through the math, you'll mm-hmm. quickly find, you know, that's quite incorrect. Okay. So, there is a slight difference. You do get that exhaust energy. Um, it's a small percentage, just probably 15 to 20 percent okay. of the actual pumping change. So, um, just want to make sure we yeah. understand that because a lot of people think it's the other way. There's this huge benefit to doing right. something, and it's it's not that big. Right, it's not but that it's big. Not. That makes sense. Right. That that does make sense. And so um, on the air charge side, uh, I've seen intercoolers have come a long way from you know 20 years ago, 10 years ago, today, and you know a while ago it had to be probably 10 years ago. I was seeing people buying kits that are non intercooled, and right. and I'm looking at it going, why would you do that? I, I I still can't wrap my mind around that and. I would have to imagine it was cost back then, or maybe fitment, but I don't. I don't hardly see non-intercooled systems anymore. Uh, other than that, do you know of any reason why people were going one way or the other? Yeah, no. I mean, back in the early days when we looked at Ford Mustangs, stuff like that, we had a an engine which was really low compression ratio. Right. I mean, most five liters are about nine point oh or right. nine point two to one compression. Right. Um, you could easily add a, a few pounds of boost to that without getting into detonation issues and, and add a bunch of power without an intercooler mm-hmm. with really simplicity, very simple system, you right. know, simply put a unit on the front and run some boost into an engine. Um, in today's world, I mean, compression right. ratios, everything's about fuel economy. We right. have to see the compression ratio to get that fuel economy. Mm-hmm. And then once you have that compression ratio, any additional temperature in that inlet will push you closer and closer to that detonation limit. Absolutely. Um, so, no, uh, Today's vehicles and new vehicles, I, I don't see anywhere we're going to go. In fact, uh, most of the time we spend is focused around understanding the efficiency of the intercooler we're using mm-hmm. and finding every way we can optimize it for that particular application. That makes um, sense. So it is a very, it's probably as big of a part of it as designing the blower. That makes sense. And when you do the intercooling on a roots type blower and you sandwich it, you know, you sandwich that. What what do you see as um, you know upsells? What are what are the good ways to improve that efficiency? Because I know people will do that. They'll do a water to air, put a heat exchanger up front. You know those things that type come the kits. What what's the best? You know in that scenario, what's the best thing you could do to get that get rid of that heat? Well, of course the the you have to have big coolers at both ends. Mm-hmm. I mean the biggest cooler out front you can get, and of course the most efficient one is great. Right. Uh, the same inside of the unit. Um, a lot of our work is spent around not only trying to fit a bigger cooler in, mm-hmm. but it's also around trying to make sure we can distribute the air equally through that cooler. Ah. Because if you put all the air through one section of that cooler, uh, it's, no no, good. No good. it's no more effective than a small cooler. Right. So you have to find creative ways to do that. Right. And a, a lot of our efforts done like that the whole way through. Um, you know, we started initially with most of our designs on the airflow bench, mm-hmm. which is you know, just basically looking at airflow to make sure we can meet the requirements we want to see mm-hmm. through these components. Uh, then from there we go to a supercharger test stand okay. uh, where we can run them and record temperatures at every port. Now, granted, that's not exactly the same as a vehicle mm-hmm. uh, because you have other stuff pulling different points. Right. So, but we will restrict them so we can even flow through every port, and then we can run the unit on the test stand. You know, driven with electric motor. Right. Uh, at the boost pressures we want to, you know, up to we can run up to twenty pounds of boost, no problem on there. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, then look at the outlet temperatures at each port, make sure our distributions are pretty close. Right. Then head to the engine dyno and validate the whole thing at the end wow. to make sure we're doing what we want to do. So you guys so. have a pretty long process involved with bringing a product from just some stuff from Eaton, <laughs> you know, some rotors and whatnot from Eaton. That's right. To yeah. the end point. Well, the plus is, 
Yeah, like I said, we have a pretty long relationship there with Eaton. Uh, right. Magnuson's been uh, working with Eaton for oh, probably upwards of 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have access to all their facility as well, which is, is beneficial to understanding sure. Um, sure. as well as, you know, making the most out of the blower we can possibly get. That is so. very, very cool. Well, uh, I am out of questions for you, my friend. Okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything you can think of that you'd like to, you know, let the people know who are watching about, you know, positive displacement blowers? No, like I said, I just, I like to say I'm, you know, fairly new here, as I, we spoke earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a new new place for me. I, I've been at Eaton there for 11, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, to come over, I've always, I'm a drag racer. Sure. Through, through an engine guy. I, so it's I've been natural. I've been cars since uh, my father could get me to walk. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've, uh, it, it's kind of, just been a great changeover for me. I love being here and uh, excited to, you know, be able to share the new products that Magnuson will release. Sure. Uh, you know, now that I will be placing a little different focus on the company than mm -hmm. what maybe has been done in the past. Gotcha. So, uh, gotcha. It should be. Uh, I'm excited and looking forward to it. So uh, awesome. Hope to see everyone at the track. Hey, so, we we really appreciate you chatting with us, man. Thank you so much. No, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. All right, Again, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye.